A while ago I posted a video of a useless box. The purpose of the box is just to turn itself off. I got a lot of questions about that, so I thought I'd make another copy and show you the process. In previous versions of this, I just went to the craft store and bought a small wooden box, but I had these scraps of pine left over from a previous project. I thought I'd just make my own wooden box. I start with what I call the, the poor man's planer. If you put some sandpaper on some ultra flat marble, you can flatten them out and get a pretty uh, tight joint. All I'm doing here is taking two cutoffs from pine two by fours and gluing them together to get a three inch strip of pine. I then take that strip over to the belt sander and level off the joint and finally take it to the chop saw and cut it to the dimensions of the box. This video really isn't intended to teach you how to make this exact one, but really show you the design process so you can make whatever size box you want. This one happens to be about five inches in its longest dimension and three inches wide on the interior dimension and three inches tall. That's the box part itself. You can see me gluing it and clamping it there. And it's a similar process for the lid. Really any box will do, but you want something with a, a fairly shallow lid because as you see, there will be a, a curved finger that has to reach up over that lid from inside the box. The materials you need for this are a wooden box, a hinge to hold the lid on, a server motor that you can modify, a toggle switch, a rocker switch, and also a, um, a battery casing. I'll show you all these as we go. The first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to glue the servo motor adapter onto this curved finger. You can see a 3, 3D printed mine, but there's no reason you can't just cut a curved finger out of wood if you don't have a 3D printer. The next step is to modify the servo. We take it apart, and if you can see there's a control board in there, we want to pull that control board out. So what we do is we desolder the control board from the motor terminals. There are just two terminals there. And then we're going to cut that wire off of the control board and solder them directly to the motor. What we're doing here is we're making a servo, changing it from a device that goes to a specific point in its rotation to make it just a motor and a gearbox that goes forward when you give it positive voltage and it reverses when you give it negative voltage. You can see here I'm putting the servo box back together after removing that control board. Once we have that, we turn our attention to the circuit. Like I said, this is a DPDT switch that stands for double pull, double throw. It's a clever circuit. I didn't make it up. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the description. But the logic here is that when you flip the switch, the finger goes forward and you want to make sure you connect the motor in the right way so that you don't reverse the wires so that it does go forward when you flip the switch. And then once that finger hits the switch, it makes the motor go backwards until it hits the limit switch, which is the, the red roller you see there. And when it hits that red roller switch, it cuts the power from the battery pack and just sits there until the whole process is repeated again when someone flips the switch. One nice thing about the circuit is when the finger retracts back into the box, as I said, it cuts the power to the battery pack. So there's no drainage of power. I've had some of these for a couple of years and the batteries seem to be still going very strong. You can see here in a moment, I'm testing the circuit just to make sure it goes forward when I flip the switch. And then it stops when I hit the limit switch, just to make sure I have the directions right. One of the most challenging parts of this project is to make sure that the arm hits the switch at the right location. I usually plan this out by drawing a side view of the box with its exact dimensions. So then I can plan out where the switch goes, where the servo is mounted, where the limit switch is mounted, and also where I'll split the lid. Once I have an idea of where all the components go, I then plan out blocks of wood to support all those components, and then I get to work. In this particular case, I needed to widen the holes on the servo and also on the limit switch just to fit the hardware that I had. I think I had number four screws and they wouldn't quite fit. I also cut some pine scrap to 
to the right dimensions for this particular application. And in a lot of this uh, assembly, I'm using super glue with accelerant just to make things quickly. I did all this in a couple of afternoons, maybe three hours total. What you see is a block here with some ears to support the servo. And then the small wedge piece under that is where the limit switch is mounted. And it's mounted so when the, the black finger piece comes back, it hits the rocker switch and cuts the power. Again, just mounting the servo and the limit switch onto the block here. In full disclosure, I actually got this wrong and had to come back and shim the servo about an eighth of an inch higher. That often happens. There's a lot of guesswork. Sometimes you have to go back and redo it. I then check one more time that the arm goes forward when I flip the switch, and then it stops when it hits the limit switch. Use some super glue to attach that whole apparatus into the box, and similarly use some super glue to attach the battery pack. I put the battery pack on the right because then when, uh, as you'll see, that makes it easier to get to the batteries when the hinged side of the top is open. There are two sides to the top. There's a, in, from where we're viewing it now, the left side will be permanently attached to the box and then the right side will hinge open. That finger will push the top open. So what I'm doing here is trying to figure out exactly where the switch gets mounted. So then I know where to split the box. And I split the box top with an angled cut. You want to do an angled cut so when the finger pushes this open, it doesn't catch anywhere. You can see the smaller side on the left will hinge open. The larger piece on the right will have the switch attached to it and be permanently glued to the box itself. In this particular case, the pine that I was using was a little bit too thick for the threads of the toggle switch, so I used a Forstner bit to countersink the washer and nut. Here I am attaching that screw to the top piece. Again, make sure you get the right direction. If you mount the switch in the wrong direction, then the, the arm would come up and hit it and really strain the servo as it tries to push it. And final step is to attach a hinge to the small hinge side of the door. I sanded it to fit and clamped it in place, marked for screws. I think these are also number four screws here. Just happen to have a bag of those in the shop. This is the third time I've made one of these useless boxes and I'd never had this problem before, but this small server was so, so powerful. It was pushing open the hinged lid and it would just flop open. So my fix for that was to put a couple of screws and attach a rubber band between those screws so that that lid would be pulled back closed after the finger retracted into the box. Final step, I decided to put some true oil on this just for a little bit of protection. After that dried, I sanded it with 400 grit as well. Cleaned up the area, and there we have it. The useless box. Give you a look on the inside there. That's it. Hope you enjoyed.